Yo, 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 turn my mic up. Oh, yeah, just like that. Hey, yo, check it. Yo, I'm rhyming off the top of the head. So I gotta get these words right or I won't get fed. You see, my voice is golden, something like a spokesperson. You wanna see me? I'm about to be GQ's moon man of the moment. And I don't mess up, so I fix it up. You come get me, you might get fixed up. Cause I wash you out like a laundry mat. You come see the king, you might fall back on your back like a heart attack. Uh. Hi and welcome to my channel. My name is Max. I'm your baby angel. This beautiful relaxing music playing in the background will make you fall asleep and you'll have sweet dreams all night long. But, I'm sure you're ready for your bedtime story right? Great. Because today I have a very special one called Against Wind and Tide. Here is the story, I hope you'll enjoy it and will subscribe to my channel for many more wondrous stories. And the story goes. Tack Ramsdale was a bad boy. He had been a bad boy so long that secretly he was rather tired of it. But he really did not know how to help himself. It was his reputation, and it is a curious thing, how naturally we all live up to our reputations. That is to say, Not but that Jack Ramsdale had fairly earned his bad name. His mother had died before he was old enough to remember her, so he had never known what home was. Once, when his father was unusually good-natured, he had asked him some questions about his mother. She was one of God's saints, if ever there was one, the man answered, half reluctantly. Everybody wondered that she took up with me, but maybe it was because she saw I needed her more than anybody else did. She might have made a difficult man of me if she'd lived. At least, I've always thought so. I never drank so much when she was alive but what I kept a comfortable home over her head. But when she was gone, it didn't appear to me there were many things left to live for. I lack comfort sorely, and I don't say but what I've sought for it in my past. Cold nights I've known her to get up half a dozen times, often, to see if the clothes were all up over your shoulders. And sometimes I've seen her stand there looking down at you in the biting cold till I thought she'd freeze. But I didn't dare to say anything for her lips were moonvine, and I knew she was praying for you. She was a praying woman, your mother was. I used to think her prayers would save both of us. I can't make out how she looked, Jack persisted. He was so anxious to hear something about this dead mother who had loved him so. Ever since she died, he had been knocked around from pillar to post, as they say, with his father. Sam Ramsdale was a good help, as all the farmers knew when he was sober. But he was not reliable, and then he had the disadvantage of as his father talked. It seemed to him so strange a thing to think that someone used to stand beside his bed in cold winter nights and pray for him, that he could hardly believe it. And he said again, out of his desolate longing. I wish I could have seen how she looked. I don't suppose folks would have said she was much to look at. His father spoke, in a musing sort of way. She was a little pale slip of a woman, with soft yellow hair drooping about her white face, 
and eyes as blue as the blue flowers you picked up along the road. But there, I can't talk about her, and I ain't going to, what's more. And don't you ever ask me again. From that time Jack never dared to ask any more questions about his mother, but all through his troublesome, turbulent boyhood. How bad he had been through the day, the nights were few when he failed to think how once a pale slip of a woman, with soft yellow hair around her white face, and eyes blue as the blue gentians, had bent above his slumbers and said prayers for him. When he was ten years old his father died in the poor house. The drink had enfeebled his constitution. A sudden cold did the rest. There were a few weeks of terrible suffering, and then the end came. Jack was with him to the last. There was nowhere else for him to be, and the father liked to have him in his sight. One day, just before the end, when they were all alone, the man called the boy to his bedside. I can't tell you to follow my example, Jack. That's the shame of it. I suppose nobody believes it, Jack. But since I've been lying here I've kinda felt nearer to her than I ever did before since she died. Seems as if I could almost hear her praying for me. And I think, by times, that the god she lived so close to won't say no. It's the eleventh hour, Jack, the eleventh hour, I know that as well as anybody. But she used to sing a hymn about when the lamp holds out to bum. When I get there I shall get rid of this awful thirst for drink. It's been an awful thirst. No hunger that I know of can match it. Those were the last connected words anyone ever heard him speak. After that, the night came on, the double night of darkness and of death. Once or twice the woman who acted as a nurse, bending over him, heard him mutter. The eleventh hour, Jack. And afterward, she wondered whether it was a presentiment, for it was just at eleven o'clock that he died. Jack had been sent to bed a little before, and when he got up in the morning, he knew that he was all alone in the world. After the funeral deacon, Small took him home. He wouldn't be of much use for two or three years to come, the deacon said. Maybe he could drive up the cows, and ride the horse to plow, and scare the crows away from the corn. But he couldn't earn his salt flood. Surely Jack Ramsdale must have eaten more salt than ever boy often ate before if he did not work enough for it. For it was Jack here, and Jack there, all day long. Jack did everybody's errands. Jack drew Mrs. Small's baby grandchild in its little covered wagon. Jack scoured the knives. Jack brought the wood. Jack picked berries. Jack weeded flower beds. From being an idle little chap, in everybody's way, as he had been in his father's time, he was pressed right into hard service, for hours in the day than any man worked about the place. Now work is good for boys, but all work and no play worse yet, all work and no love is not good for anyone. Jack grew bitter, and where he dared to be cruel, he was cruel. Where he dared to be insolent. But as the years went on, five of them, he grew to be generally considered a bad boy. At fifteen he was strong of his age, a man, almost, in size. His schooling had been confined to the short winter terms, and he had always been the terror of every successive schoolmaster. When he was fifteen, a new teacher came a handsome, graceful young man, just out of college. He was slight rather than stout, well-dressed, well-mannered, fit, you would have said, for a lady's drawing room, 
rather than the country schoolhouse in winter with its big boys, tough customers, many of them, and Jack Ramsdale, the toughest customer of all. After Mr. Garrison had passed his... Ralph Garrison smiled a calm smile but uttered no boasts. He had been a week in the school before he had any special trouble. Jack was taking his measure. The truth was, the boy had a certain amount of taste, and Garrison's gentlemanliness impressed him more than he would have cared to own. It is possible that he might have gone on quietly and obediently, but that now his bad name began to weigh him down. The boys who had looked up to him as a leader in evil grew impatient of his quiet submission to rules. Got your match, Jack? Said one. Going to a beat without giving it a try. Said another. And Jack began to think that the evil laurels he had won, as the bravo and bully of the school, would fall withered from his brow if he didn't make some effort to fasten. For a moment Mr. Garrison looked at him. Then he remarked, with ominous quietness, in a tone lower and more gentle than usual. Jack, this is not the place or time for eating. My place and time to eat are when I am hungry, Jack answered, with cool insolence, cutting off a mouthful and carrying it deliberately to his mouth. You will put up that apple instantly if you please. Still, the teacher spoke very gently and turned a little pale. The play asterisk sways his words and a slight paleness misled Jack. Then, he never knew how it was, but suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, he felt pulled from his seat out into the middle of the floor while knife and apple flew from his hand. He kicked, he struggled, he tried to strike, but an iron grasp held his wrists. The strong muscles of the stroke or at Harvard did good service. The handsome face was pale, but the lips were set like steel, and the cool lights never wavered as they fixed and held those of the young bully. Then suddenly he whipped from his pocket a ball of strong fish line and bound the struggling wrists tightly, and, pushing a chair toward his captive, said coolly, I want nothing more of you till after school. I took you a little by surprise, he said. Perhaps you're not yet satisfied that I'm stronger than you. Yes, I'm satisfied, Jack answered. I ain't so mean but what I'm willing to own beat when it's done fair and square. Mr. Garrison, meanwhile, was untying his wrist. As he unwound the last coil, he said, The forces of law and order are what rule the world. I think if you fight against them, you will always be likely to find yourself on the losing side. A great little wave of defiance swelled up in Jack's heart. Not against Mr. Garrison as an individual, but against such as he, handsome, graceful, cultured, against his own hard lot, against a prosperous world. God did it. He made you handsome and strong and had you go to school and college and grow up a gentleman. And he made me how the face dark and hear what you see. He took my mother, who did love me and pray for me, away from me when I wasn't more than three years old. He gave me to a father who drank hard and taught me nothing good. And then he took even him from me and handed me over to Deacon Small. And I tell you, teacher, you don't know what a tough time is till you have summoned and wintered with Deacon Small. I've got a bad name, and who wonders? And I feel like living up to it. I hadn't anything against you especially. But if I'd given in peaceably to all your rules, the boys would have said I had grown chicken-hearted, 
and a little name for pluck is all a name I have got. But do you know what I think God has been doing for you in giving you all these hard knocks? The things don't happen. God never lets go the reins. The boy looked the question he did not speak and Mr. Garrison went on. I think he has been making you strong just as rowing against wind and tide made my wrist strong until now you could fight all your enemies if you would. The thing we are put here for, he continued, is to do our best. And if we are doing that, in God's sight, there is nothing that can prevail against us. Not faith, or foes, or poverty, or any other creature. There is nothing in all the universe that is strong enough to stand against a soul that is bound to go up and not down. You may go home now. It was one of Mr. Garrison's merits that he knew when to stop. Jack Ramsdale went home with that last sentence ringing in his ears. There is nothing in all the universe that is strong enough to stand against a soul that is bound to go up and not down. The words went with him all the rest of the day. They lay down with him at night, and he looked out of his window and fixed his eyes on a bright, far-off star, and thought of them. What if he should turn all the strength that was in him to going up and not down? If he did right, who could make him afraid? If he served willingly, he need fear no master. It was very late, and the star, obedient to the law which rules the world, had marched far on, out of his sight, before he went to sleep. He had made a resolve. In the strength of that resolve, he awoke to the new day. I will not go down, he said to himself. I will go up and down. He was not all at once transformed from singer to sane. Such sudden changes do not belong to this low world. But the purpose and aim of his life were changed. Never again did he lose sight of the shining heights he meant to climb. If the mother in the heavenly home could look down on the world below, she knew that not in vain had she been a praying woman. To Mr. Garrison, the boy's devotion was something wonderful, humble, loyal, faithful, and never ceasing. From being the teacher's terror, Jack had become the teacher's friend. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to watch my other videos and come back for more exciting ones.